been really special. Um, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm a, a part of a collective called Pink Noise Projects. If you want to follow us online, we are an, another artist-run space. Um, I'm coming from typically sculpture for the last couple of years, but I started doing drawing again in um, January 2021. This was mostly because of the pandemic. It was hard to get to my studio very frequ frequently, so it was easier to have the um, immediate output of drawing. This was the first drawing I did after really a couple years of sculpture, so it's quite big. Um, I'm going to start with a couple photos from, from, uh, excuse me, from some sculptural work. So this is a wall hanging sculpture. The sculptures were really concerned with um, fictional smart objects. So I was really interested in making things that looked um, looked like they mimicked a screen or have had some kind of function, but they were always um, prescribed to be helpful psychologically. So the image on the left is um, something that is supposed to look like some sort of monitor, but in a more peaceful way. And the image on the right is um, referencing any kind of internal domestic fixture, like a thermostat or um, air vent or something. But it was always very important to me to use um, materials and have the, the hand be very noticeable. So all of the sculptures were really, I never tried to hide the fact, excuse me. <laughs> Um, I never tried to hide the fact that they were handmade, although I would try my best to make them look, um, look functional and look polished enough to pass as objects. And I was really interested in surveillance technology and um, just objects that you take for granted that you use every day. So these images on the left, or the image on the left is supposed to look like um, something is monitoring you or you are interfacing with something. And on the right, it's a, a sculpture that is more movable. So the gray, the gray pieces were supposed to be like tablets, but they're very chunky and textured. And the pieces, the colorful pieces had, they were movable so you could create a kind of system with them. And this is just another example of a small wall hanging sculpture. So. I've always been interested in symmetry versus asymmetry and trying to work with both the idea of functionality but also um, really making it clear that these are handmade, so kind of like paranoid objects that are helpful to you somehow. So when I started drawing again, I was really, everything I've made Prior to working in sculpture for a couple of years, everything was always, my previous drawings were always very diagrammatic. Um, when I started drawing again, I was really interested in decision making processes and making things that, similar to the sculptures, looked like they had a function or an Im implied functionality. Um, what I've been trying to focus on here and prior to coming here is the idea of making um, exploring frameworks, so relationships you have with yourself in terms of how you make decisions based off your personality or your um, neuroses or your, you know, what makes you you, how you became who you were. Um, your external environment, so being a part of um, being part of a society or different different cultures you're a part of. So this could be governmental structures or influence from apps or however you experience the world and your relationships with other people. So how you can judge strangers, but also how you foster relationships with friends and family. I think the two biggest questions I have right now would be are questioning the position of the individual. So wondering if you like, do we ever, are we ever responsible for creating our own frameworks around our decisions? and how often are we influenced to make certain decisions over others. 
Um, while at Zaratan, the images or the drawings I have here are a continuation of this idea of a playful system. So everything, I think, for me, whether it's sculpture or, or drawing, is always kind of sincere, but it looks playful and goofy too. So uh, really large, bold shapes and so on. Um, these drawings at Zaratan are a continuation of being systems, and they're either a continuous system, so giving the illusion that it's uh, looping or ongoing, or having a, a, a finite start and ending point. Um, I think similar threads through all the drawings are the balance between geometry and expression. So I like to really use expression making and kind of scribbling or just more organic shapes to indicate the kind of spirit of the individual um, versus geometry, which could imply any framework, whether it's a self-imposed framework or the societal framework. Um, geometry is just an easy way to imply the like, order and structure. If um, I like to repeat shapes to indicate uh, repetitive thought or the development of a thought pattern. Sometimes I have two of the same shape, but one will be composed of smaller parts, um, and one is just a whole shape. So that could indicate multiple facets of an idea versus like a solid, you know, like I want coffee versus should I have coffee? What do I have to do today? Should I have tea instead? Is that too much caffeine? And so on. Um, and symmetry and asymmetry are often used to indicate um, weighing or measuring decisions or outcomes and the arrival at a choice. So here are some drawings uh, from Zaratan. This is an example of using uh, four, four shapes that are similar to each other but different enough to express um, a choice. So this could be, this signifies kind of maybe thinking about one, one question and the different outcomes. Towards the end of the residency, I, I feel like my flow was very, uh, I became very structured and then the last couple of drawings were very expressive. So this is, um, this is an attempt at kind of breaking, breaking up the geometry by having the grid that kind of dissolves with the imposition of the the kind of twofold choice and the framework that is either blocking blocking the action or the the spirit or um, allowing it to break. This is one of the last drawings I made here. So um, this was very expressive for me. And I just wanted to play with this idea of a grid that looked more organic from the start. It's not, it's not using a ruler. And then all the kind of expression coming out of the grid is coming from one, from one block. So what I want to focus on today is um, I was really influenced in my time here by reading these two books. So one is a textbook called Visualizing Psychology um, by Siri Carpenter and Karen Huffman. And one is, that was just kind of a psych 101 textbook to understand what's happening in the brain. And the second is called The Power of Experiments uh, by Michael Luca and Max Bazerman. It's more about behavioral economics and how, um, uh, how certain apps or big data companies can influence us without our knowing. So for this talk, what I'd like to do is just share some concepts that I'm interested in, that I'm uh, looking forward to building upon um, in the future when I get home, but just what has most excited me, what's been most exciting to learn about here. So I'm going to go through some concepts and then also show some drawings from this month at Zaratan, but also from the past. So the first, um, the first thing that I was really interested in learning about was how thought process, processes actually work. So thought processes are distributed through the brain and neural networks. Um, we get help from mental images, concepts, and hierarchies, or 
uh, group specific concepts as subcategories. So a hierarchy would be instead of going directly to a parakeet, for example, we have animal, bird, parakeet. Um, there's two types of concepts. One is an artificial concept, so that is um, logical rules or definitions, and they're found in science and sharply defined. So the rules of a triangle being a triangle and so on. And then we have uh, natural concepts, which are, actually I think these are switched around. Supposed to be switched around. But um, natural concepts are based off their prototypes, based off a of representation of the concept. So when you see a bird, you don't think warm blooded mammal that flies, you just say bird. Um, one theory I was really interested in was this, um, this idea of a locus of control, which is developed by Julian Rotter, who's a social cognitive theorist from the 70s. Um, he was influential for two reasons. The first is that he, he believed that um, your experiences create expectancies for future, future experiences, and that your personality and behavior are determined by what you expect to happen, balanced with the expectations you have on that outcome. Um, what's most interesting to me is this idea of a locus of control. So everyone has, or if, if you believe his theory, you believe that everyone has a certain sense of why things happen and if you have control over that. So if you have an external locus of control, you think that um, the world has a significant impact on your life. Um, and if you have, and, and you, you think that you don't have a lot of agency to control your life, you're kind of a victim of circumstances. And if you have an internal locus of control, you think more that you can control events in your life through your effort. So if you're depressed, you could think, I'm just depressed because the world's depressing. I can't, you know, I'm not making enough money. That would be an external locus. And internal would be, I can help myself to get out of my depression. Um, it's important to note that a lot of social cognitive theorists were criticized for ignoring the unconscious and um, ignoring emotion, but I still just found, find these ideas pretty interesting. And I think I'm interested in how that can influence our decision making, like if you think you have the power to do something versus versus not. So this is an older drawing. It's about three and a half feet wide. This is one of the first drawings that showed a kind of infinite system. So what I wanted to do was show um, a grid, but still show it th with an organic, organic um, shapes, I guess, and then. Most of the composition goes in and out of this funnel, but then there's this kind of outlier shape that maybe shows or indicates to me like a lingering thought or something that's holding you back from moving forward. So this is from, I think, February. These are two examples of early drawings or early collages that I thought looked more effective when they were scanned. Um, and these were attempts at showing kind of repetitive thought or slow movement of thought. So these both show repeti um, repeating shapes, but with very subtle movements. This is a kind of early example of trying to show the, a pathway of thought with the more of a, a closed composition and then it opens up. And on the right is the same, just kind of general sphere. Um, with some lines to show repetition of thought. Um, this is also just an early scan of, a, of another iteration of this drawing on the right. So this, this was made from scanning on the Xerox. So it exists as a print, but it was um, originally a scan of some sculptural parts. So I liked, I liked this because it was just a really simple um, 
kind of open and close, kind of showing like the beginning of an idea versus fully being in the space of an idea. Before I used to, I used to scan sculptures a lot to try to manipulate them um, to, to have a 2D version of the 3D. So it's something I want to revisit again, but I haven't, um, I have to finish some sculptures when I come back first. <laughs> Uh, so the second area I was really interested in from these two books was how we approach solving problems. Um, so the definition of solving a problem is moving from a given state of or the problem to the goal state or a solution. And this involves three steps of preparation, production, and evaluation. So it's not always a seamless um, a seamless system. You could think you have a solution to a problem and then if your problem, if you get to evaluation, like let's say you try to build a bed and you realize you have the wrong screws. Technically you would be going from the evaluation stage but back to production. Um, but where it becomes interesting is we all, we all have barriers to solving problems and we've all developed mental sets that make it make us feel like we are more prepared to solve problems quickly and efficiently. Um, usually we like to try to stick to how we know to, to how we know to approach to solve a problem than trying a new solution. Um, and the term for that was really coined in the 70s by two um, economists Dan Kahneman and Amos Zversky. So the word for this is heuristics, and they're cognitive rules of thumb people use to make decisions quickly and effectively. Heuristics are really interesting because on the one hand, they save us a lot of time in processing because we're, we go from our experience, um, but they also make us have more personal biases or can allow us to ignore new information because we're sticking to what we know. So heuristics are nice because they, they allow you to feel like you can trust your intuition, but they can prevent you from trying new things. Um, we also always deal with what's called a confirmation bias, which is the inclination to seek information that reaffirms what we already think um, and to overlook contradictory evidence. So. Um, this could be as simple as smoking. Like if you love smoking, um, you could easily just like ignore that smoking is bad for you or so on. <laughs> but even something, you know, we do it all the time without really thinking about it. So like gravitating towards friends that have similar political beliefs or, um, and so on. So there's two type of heuristics. Um, one is the availability heuristic, which is more experiential. This is based off um, based off your memory and your personal experience. So if you, like for me, I, I broke my wrist when I was 10 riding a scooter, which my sister <laughs> remembers and actually has on tape. So if, if someone were to approach me to ride a scooter, I could really quickly go to a place of, no, I'm going to get hurt because that happened to me. Um, and that's like personal to my experience. And there's also the representative, uh, representative heuristic, which is making a judgment um, based off our formed stereotypes. And this is more observational, so influence from TV or just you know things outside of your experience. And unfortunately, I think representative heuristics have a lot to do with um, implicit bias and things like racism and how you everyone has like snap judgments about certain cultures outside of themselves sometimes. This is just a funny graphic I found <laughs> explaining the availability heuristic. So the person is, you know, watching a shark attack or watching sharks on TV. He goes to the beach, he thinks that the people are, you know, very prone to getting attacked by a shark. So this is why it's interesting because on the one hand you want to you want to believe that your life experience is valuable in helping you in the world but sometimes it can it can hold you back if you don't um, 
take a moment to reflect on these things. So heuristics are probably like the, the biggest area of interest for me right now. I'm really happy to have learned about the two types and um, build more off of that. There's a second idea that kind of goes with heuristics, which is, um, so Dan Kahneman, who is one of the people who coined the term hu heuristics, he wrote a book that references this other idea called the dual systems model. This kind of has to do with kind of left brain, right brain things people talk about, but the idea is that our, our minds can operate in two ways, and we have two systems. The first would be intuitive, um, so making decisions really quickly, effortlessly, and giving a lot of um, merit to our emotional reactions. The second is more deliberate, so really slowing down and trying to think consciously through a decision. Um, typically, system one is more automatic, but it leads to more biases, but it's usually how we get through day-to-day -day life um, because we're too busy to use system two all the time. So the example in the book was the idea of picking a loaf of bread from the supermarket. If you were to engage system two, you could stand there for like 20 minutes thinking about where is this bread coming from? Like, am I, am I supporting the right things? Is this best for my health? Versus just like, I just want to get out of the store, whatever, any bread is, I like this bread, it's fine. Um, the book argues in Power of Experiments that if you want to make better decisions when faced with important choices, you should listen to your gut, but you should also try to engage system two and try to th approach things a little bit more deliberately. And they also give an example of building a grill. So you could buy a grill and just think, okay, like ready to put this together, no problem, don't need the instructions. Um, but system two would ask you to slow down, maybe ask your friends or family if you should use the instructions and uh, they say yes. <laughs> you know, you can't do it all. So these are, these are some drawings from uh, the winter as well. So although I didn't have the terminology that I'm referencing yet or at this time, these were just kind of early uh, intuitive ways of thinking about um, weighing between two, two outcomes. And I often use a lot of, I feel like there's often, often like a landscape influence. So whether it's like a new day or the sun or something that looks a little celestial um, to kind of show, you just moving through time and having a, that, that aspect thrown in. So in the image on the right, this is, I think, like two by, f by four feet. Um, you have the different, um, the repetitive thought kind of outlined with the white line and then the kind of weight. I'm just gonna wait a second. You have this kind of under, the underbelly of, of a heavier thought coming underneath. This is one of the, the earliest, it's a painting actually, um, trying to show repetition of thought or a thought sequence. So I started this in a really ordered way on the bottom left. Um, and it's a little hard to see here, but there's different symbols in each, in each dot that is positive, negative, open or closed. So this is kind of a pre, this is from like a year and a half ago, but it's, now I understand it as like a precursor to my interest now. Um, so in the process, it was really nice to start with really strict order. The dots are all the same size and then allowing things to get a little more organic. Um, so the second kind of framework, those are kind of the concepts I'm interested in in our, our thought processes with ourselves. The second is um, societal framework. So the two concepts I was really interested in were about this idea of nudging. So Richard Thaler, who is a behavioral um, economist, he coined this term nudging in his book to refer to how governments or any kind of corporation really um, has the influence of framing a situation 
that influences the outcome. So he, this could be, so pretty much the way things are presented to you um, from the framework can influence you without you knowing. He coined this also, this term choice architect. So the biggest example would be like a government. The governments are, different governments are responsible for not only designing the available options for citizens, but how they're presented. And best case scenario, things are designed to help people, um, help people and put us in a direction to leave things better off, but this is not always the case. Um, one of, I think within this idea of choice architecture is how, how decisions are framed. So one of the interesting examples that they talked about was um, organ donation, which has been a little controversial in the US. Um, basically what they had talked about was that state to state, you can, you can apply to be an organ donor or sometimes it's, it's a given fact, meaning you can opt in. So you register with the state, you can be presented with a form that says, would you like to be an organ donor, yes or no. States um, have, experience, have tried things where people are automatically organ donors and they have to take initiative to opt out. Um, and so these two economists, Judd Kessler and Al Roth, tried an experiment within different European countries um, and they found that the four with opt-in opt systems had lower rates and the seven with opt-out had higher rates. So this became a little controversial because some people felt like they, um, there's just a lot of questions, like what if someone doesn't want to be an organ donor but they don't get around to opting out? Um, or some people felt offended that they were automatically set up to be an organ donor for religious or personal reasons. Um, or on the other hand, if the default setting is to opt in, maybe it provides a sense of moral, moral obligation to people. But a lot of people felt like it should be, it shouldn't be opt in or out. You should kind of just be given the option of the choice to begin with. So this is the beginning of, um, at least in this example, of active choice. So instead of, um, instead of getting to a web page and saying, it's saying you are an organ donor or you're not, it's just the, the choice of would you like to be yes or no, and it's not automatically one way or the other. Um, but they actually found in this experiment that active choice was pretty ineffective and fewer people signed up to be donors than when it was an opt-in program. But California, New York, and the UK recently switched from opt-in to active choice. So it's, I just thought that was an interesting example because it's something that can change uh, not only state to state, but country to country. And I think for me, what I got from that is the idea of um, this idea of default settings. And although the chapter was really outlining plays out with um, you know, organ donation and in politics, I'm really interested in using this as a metaphor for our internal frameworks. So um, some questions I have are, can people identify their own default settings or attitudes towards maybe being more risk seeking or um, things like that? Like, can, can you identify parts of your personality that you think are just how you are? quote unquote, and challenge that um, by readjusting the framework of, of a problem. So I'm really, I think the idea of opt-in, opt-out, active choice, um, those are things I'd like to build off um, in the future as well. So this is another earlier drawing that is, it's pretty simple, just the idea of two different um, just echoing two sequences, so just kind of this idea of yes or no, or this or that. This is a drawing that I finished before coming here, which is kind of a totally new topic from what I'm talking about, but this was, um, this was pretty big. This is a for, big for me, it's like six feet long. Um, 
and it's an attempt to make a sequence that goes from day to night and then cycles back. So the last area I wanted to talk about was um, how we relate to people. So attributions are how we explain behavior, explanations for behavior or events which help us determine how to relate to other people. And this really comes down to judging someone's internal disposition versus external situation. Um, and making that choice is central to judging someone's actions. So if you see someone, um, you know, someone, you're walking on the street and someone bumps into you really aggressively and you have, an, uh, you have a choice, you could say, oh, you know, what an asshole, they're not looking where they're going. Or you could say, I don't really know what that person's experienced today. Maybe, um, maybe they're not an asshole, they're just, you know, something bad happened to them. Where we have problems is that we, we tend to really favor judging people's personalities over their over the uh, external environment because it's it's more noticeable and it's easier for us so that's referred to as the fundamental attribution error um, where you really go for the personality first before giving some consideration for um, the environment or the situations that are making someone act a certain way and for ourselves, we have a self-serving bias. So when, that's when we tend to favor our, our internal attributes for our successes and blame the external for our failures. So if you failed a driving test, it's a lot easier to blame, you know, that stop sign being hidden behind a tree than just like admitting that you didn't break in time and so on. Um, our, another thing that's important to consider is just our attitudes and where our attitudes can come from. So an attitude is defined as a learned predisposition to respond cognitively, effectively, and behaviorally to people or objects in a specific way. Um, and we develop our attitudes from our experiences, but also from watching, watching other people and from, from media, watching movies and TV and listening to music. Um, there's also this idea of cognitive dissonance, which is, it's a discomfort caused by an attitude and a behavior, attitudes uh, bumping heads with each other or having a discrepancy. So that could be like, you know, knowing smoking is bad for you, but loving to smoke, um, which is like, you know, all of us here. <laughs> Um, so contradictions between attitudes and behaviors can also motivate you to change your attitude so they agree with your behaviors. Um, and I think just examining our own attitudes is helpful in realizing how we approach other people, at least for me. And I found these, um, I found these illustrations from a New Yorker article that showed the article was called When Cognitive Dissonance is Okay. Um, so there are just two examples by these two artists. One, the one on the left says, refusing to spend an extra 10 cents for a paper bag because I'm cheap, but then the dissonance is spending $16 on a salad that only has one tiny piece of half-cooked chicken. <laughs> so maybe the decision not to buy a bag feels good, but then you're, you know, you're spending a lot of money on an expensive salad. And the second one is, I should reduce the amount of time I spend on Instagram, but not right now. <laughs> so I think cognitive dissonance is something that's talked about a lot with um, use of smartphones or just in so many ways, but it's just something um, I think that has a big role in our, our attitudes towards people as well. So these are some, some other drawings that I've made here at Zaratan. This is, this is a drawing I made probably in the halfway point. So um, I tried to make, I've tried to show the repetitive thought using um, color temperature, but also the grid to make it go back into space. And then the bottom half shows this kind of weight, um, but it's, it's symmetrical, but it's not really aligned. And there's more expressive mark making with the markers. 
this is one of the pieces that showed um, symmetry in equal equal kind of main shapes, but then within each shape is a different... Oh, it's upside down. Maybe not. No, it, that's the right way, actually. Oh, then the one in the gallery is upside down. No? Is that right? Really? <laughs> then you are creating a complicated smell. Justin, you should leave it drawing because upside down. I was sure also. We can change it. <laughs> um, I liked this one because I was happy with how it felt like it was a little bit more mechanical and each each shape had a really different system going on within it, but they were all similar enough to show a repetition of thought. This is the first drawing I made here. Um, so this is kind of before I took a detour and, and getting really structured. So this has the symmetry with the, the brown frame um, showing kind of something happening, coming outward and then repeating itself. And that's it. So thank you so much. It's been a really great month here, and I'm sad to leave. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yay. It's like amazing how, how rich your presentation was in terms of concepts. Thanks. I think one question rises to me there is um, how did you arrive to this research? Like, uh, why this question of how our choices uh, came to life, both in a brain sense or in a social sense, developed in your mm -hmm. work? Well, I think, I think I've always been a little bit of an anxious person, and so I think s some of it comes from, you know, just kind of wondering why I could repeat certain thoughts, or my sister knows if I'm, if I have a problem, I can get really fixated, and, um, so trying to examine my own thought loops. But with the sculptures, I was, I feel like sometimes I wanted to make things that really looked like they had a function, but you had to choose either this or that, like move things this way or that way. Um, I think it took some time. I don't think, you know, showing that drawing from, with the red dots, that was, that kind of started just as like a meditative drawing for me. I think really what happened was when with sculptures, I was attaching a lot of meaning to exploring smart objects. And I realized that I wasn't really interested in the smart objects as, I mean, I was interested in surveillance technology, but it felt almost like a crutch. And I was like, I'm not interested in what the smart objects are doing as much as um, things having a psychological function to be helpful. So um, I think the textbook was recommended to me as a really helpful way of just starting, starting like basic psychology research. And then in June when I was at a, a different residency, someone um, gave me a studio visit and was like, it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is kind of about marketing if you want to try to locate yourself in a more you know what's happening today. So, which actually we call the job of the devil because <laughs> yeah. it's really touching with the behavior of psychology and it's really yeah. strange carrier. It felt very intimidating because I don't have any experience with marketing or economics, um, but it was interesting to read about because you're you're not really aware even something like how how Uber is laid out. You're not really aware that it's kind of pushing you to, it wants you to take your own car, you know, versus sharing in some subtle ways. Um, so I think it took some time, and that's why I feel really lucky, because this is the first time in a really long time that I feel like I have really clear direction, and it's not kind of like grasping for, like the smart objects, were a genuine interest, but it did also feel a little bit like a crutch, like I well, need to... For me, I just, maybe it's just an outsider perspective, but I see that objects are quite um, humanized, and so I feel there is also this contrast between uh, 
like they constructing something very social into something more textural and more touchy and and kind of goofy also or ironic and being a, I don't see such a jump from Stafford to here, mm. uh, which is something I probably came to realize through the presentation. For me, it was kind of in a, a question. I will be excited to do, I'm not really done with sculpture, but I think in the pandemic and it, it was the best option for me to feel productive because I couldn't get to my studio. Um, and so I'm, I think in the future, I'd like to incorporate it again too. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy with the time to be able to, to research this. That's why I was so nervous to talk because I was like, I, I just learned about these concepts and they're exciting to me, but I haven't really like, you know, I'm going home with the intention of building upon them. Um, so yeah. For me, that's probably better. I was really also enjoying when you were showing this thing of the 3D sculpture, um, also because probably in the present, from the drawing to the printing, I think there is something also there about layering, and mm. I think layering is also a way to uh, complexify this idea of decision into such style or individual. And I just want to share also something that for me was a revelation, I hope for you was also, <laughs> it will be also. Recently we have this uh, philosopher and writer from Holland and she was um, speaking about how monogamy is something that is set up by this society. And something she said I was feeling much better was we are so feeling guilty about being jealous of previous relationship with our partner mm. uh, because also we have this uh, very politic idea of every relation we go through we get a better person. So we have this idea of shutting other out by thinking, yeah, this makes me who I am right now. But it isn't true. I, I'm so happy of being jealous if I love somebody of their friends, of their... I think it's natural because the past is the past and it's still here. Yeah. So for me it was a point that I understand how important it is to rethink the information we get from society and, you know, just making it ourselves and rethinking it for another model. And I think this was very rich in terms of uh, really, we are not, it's our brain, it's ourself, but we are in a struggle between ourselves and society and our objective and... Yeah, I think it's, yeah, thank you. I think it feels, it's, it feels empowering to recognize, like, for, for me, if I can get really, you know, thought in a, or stuck in a thought spiral or feel, it's just empowering to realize you have agency to really think about, like, what's influencing you. Um, so, yeah, I feel really happy with my time here. I don't want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> a small question. Um, when I look to the, the sculpture, uh, you're using a lot of uh, gypsum and uh, plastic. Like, how, how was the, um, and the, the drawings use a lot of materials um, from pencils to pens. Yeah. Just looking good. A collage. It makes total sense when I'm looking at the gypsum and the sponge and the gypsum. It, it looks, it's not familiar. There's some some kind of strangeness when you look at it. And um, when you think about the, um, how do you, it's more a question of how do you choose the materials for the drawings? It's for a, it's more practical, I'm not using the, Stylish design, right? I, I, I totally understand why you do it. Uh, I think. I think <laughs> um, but if you can just talk a little 
think it's about the, the colors. The colors are uh, you, you, you talk to the, uh, the, the colors and the materials. Just for this. Uh, for the drawings. Yeah. I think I think the color is always pretty intuitive for me. I I think that I try to have um, dominant colors that maybe are the primary focal points, but then try to, um, I think compositionally with materials and color-wise, trying to make things uncomfortable. Because for a, lot, for a lot of years, I really had a hard time being uncomfortable with things. So like colors that are hard to go together or um, sculpturally, I really always wanted things to look really perfect. And I think it took me a long time to realize that when things, things are only really interesting when you kind of resist that. So I think a lot of the colors come from wanting to, wanting to be very harsh, um, but also choosing things that don't, that would make your eye go around and not just you know, kind of require, hopefully, require you to try to spend more time wondering why. So I think like this, these two yellows are very, maybe not universally, but most people would agree that they're like, you know, easy colors, they're kind of happy colors. So then having like scribbling brown and gray, those are more neutral and um, just provide more of a contrast. So I think I'm trying to I'm trying to get better at when I think something looks nice and easy, like trying to add something that would contrast that a little bit. And I think with this, it's so that way of thinking started with sculpture work, because um, I realized that people and myself would want to spend more time looking at things if you have to wonder why you, you don't just accept it as like a polished product. So I when I'm happy with something, I try to think about one element that would um, throw, a, throw a wrench in the system or just maybe make you wonder why it's there. So some of them have, like I think this is a little more, this is more quiet. It doesn't have a lot of contrast except for the fact that the yellow, yellow and gray are more neutral against these really warm tones. But something like this, this is like all high contrast and um, I think the drawings here were more experimental with that. But I think, um, yeah, trying to hopefully give people an opportunity to wonder, wonder why. Like, why would she put this brown that looks almost like a green? Um, so it's something I want to keep pushing because I still think I have a tendency to make things kind of like tied up in a bow sometimes. Um, but trying to get a little weirder still. So. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was very interested in the, the psych psychological uh, thoughts you had for, for your art here. Um, I, I read about an, an experiment made in the, in the 80s in which um, your, your subconscious makes the decision before you think about it. Oh, interesting. Uh, like putting my beer here on the floor. Already, it already decided for me. I never thought about it. So it's all that inti in intuition, that uh, deliberation, um, that well. In, in this case, free will doesn't exist with, with this experiment. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I agree, if I want to agree with it. Uh, but but my my question for your uh, for your deliberate uh, decision making. Do you think it was more intuitive or more deliberate? Like to even start thinking about it? Yeah. Hmm. How much it uh, was influenced by uh, what's external to you, what's in in you, but in in you? Like yeah. The, yeah, that's a really tough question. From the, since you were born, you know? Yeah. It's the stuff we, we do. I think that it it seemed like a external decision to i started realizing i was thinking about it a lot but i guess i guess you could answer it both ways cuz you could say if i wasn't an anxious person would i really start thinking about that so much so maybe it is 
I don't really know how to answer it. Maybe it is something that came, maybe I think I chose it, but I didn't, didn't really choose it. <laughs> well, it's probably a mix. <laughs> yeah. For everything, yeah. I would say I like to think as an artist that I came up with, I came up with an idea, but I probably didn't. <laughs> I think so, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't agree with the person who told you that your work seemed to be interested in marketing because I feel like marketing is just psychology applied to selling stuff. Like it's very mm -hmm. specific and I feel like your interest is more psychology more broadly. Yeah, I think they were trying to give me a way to I think at the time they could tell that I didn't really know how to how to research things in a like relevant way or a way that was approachable to or like meaningful to like how how we live life every day but yeah it was I mean reading that book was pretty f mixed I feel like a lot of it I was like I don't know how to read about this cuz I don't um, no, no, and, you yeah, <laughs> but then there would be moments that felt like they were really um, like a perfect fit. So I don't know, I don't know if I would take marketing really far, but I do. I'm happy to have read this much about it right now. Yeah, yeah. I feel like user experience might be something else too. Like UX designers who like build websites to like like you're saying about the app thing. But yeah, choice. <laughs> yeah, I also would like to say something, but this is not really a question, this is more an observation. Uh, something I noticed in most of your drawings, this is uh, like the duality uh, that exists in like, I would say, uh, like 80% of your drawings. There are always two elements, well not really in this one, in some other drawings this is more obvious. <laughs> uh, but like the repetitive pattern of like two elements or one element and there is always like a, it's twins you know just next to, to it mm. and why only two you know like because it's really like something I notice in most of your drawings and uh, some uh, other uh, rare occasions there are like sometimes you know like three uh, repetitive patterns but yeah. most of the time this is two yeah that's that's an interesting point I think I think sometimes it's easy for me to think about like this or that mm. and I think that's tricky territory because I don't really want there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that that kind of binary thinking is not something I really want to like I want to be more in the gray area not just like black or white mm. in a lot of a lot of ways in life um, I think it could be something even like scale, like these drawings are small, mm -hmm. but it, that definitely would be something to consider for um, future drawings. Yeah, maybe like 20 or something would be good. Thanks. Um, I was wondering um, if you were in your process of um, trying to capture how the concepts flow uh, and develop and the thought processes happening. I, I, I quite like the fact that you're using quite a lot of the, your, your, your drawings are quite expressive. Thank um, you. And that's maybe a lot of that is quite emotional. But I was wondering if, um, if, if you find in some uh, elements that um, then you find useful and you reuse them and uh, you think, oh, okay, so now I'm, I'm kind of breaking down the thought concept. Uh, the thought process into uh, into particular elements, and mm. then I'm relating them to, to, to visual elements that I'm using. Uh, are, you, are, are you starting to find these elements, or um, are you always um, trying to use something new when you express? Thank you the for the question. Um, I think right up to this point, it's been very investigative trying to find new things but I think why I'm so excited about my time here is I feel like I have enough to kind of be very intentional and really build build a series with specific uh, with specific rules going forward so I think right now there's not a lot of um, repeating repeating aspects visually but I think one of my goals for getting home 
and future work is to really be like really try to build a world like really try to come up with a code of this symbol implies this um, so I hope to get there but I don't think I'm there yet yeah. <laughs> yeah I feel very lucky it's been a really long time of trying to you know work intuitively and step back and inform what that is um, and this feels like the first time since my the sculptural show I had two summers ago I think this is the first time that I really feel confident in like this is really what I, I want to be working with and it's it doesn't feel forced um, so yeah I feel very happy about that we'll just have to check back in like another year <laughs> to see that's very quick yeah well thank you it's amazing thank you so much <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I think everyone. we would still have a question to him, but we want more person. You don't need to reply clearly, but I'm curious if any of the drawing you think of your own decision at some point, or if you refer to, I don't know, societal decision, or if you completely are creating a method that allows you to refer in a very abstract way. If in and when I, what I meant by you don't need to share, it's about you don't need to know if uh, this drawing is between a coffee or a tea. Yeah. But if you do use this kind of uh, personal experience to feed the drawing, thank you. I, I do, I sometimes do, but then I see, sometimes I find that it's, I will get really like too specific and I feel like it, it almost looks like an illustration if I know too too specifically what decision it is. Um, so I try to not. There there are usually combinations or abstractions, but I do think going forward it would be nice to to be more specific, but in an, in a more informed way. Um, so that's pretty much where it's going. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we really Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Yeah, yeah, or we can do it uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Okay. <laughs> okay, c'est parti. Uh, sorry about that. My presentation, fortunately, is not as rich as Rebecca, so I'm definitely the bad student uh, <laughs> for this time. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for coming. So, my name is Marcy Petit, and I'm a French multimedia artist, and I live in London. So this is my second residency, and I am very happy to present uh, the result of this residency, which is a cyanotype as installation on ceramic, and more specifically on tiles, handmade tiles. But before to talk more about this work, I would like to maybe like to tell you more a little bit about myself and about my artistic practice. So, as I just said before, I'm a multimedia mixed media artist. It means that I like to work with like a multitude of mediums and techniques. For example, I work a lot with video, audio recordings, photography, performance, textile, textile work, uh, writings, objects, well, anything. Basically, any mediums can be considered and engaged in my work. What really matters to me, this is. Um, the idea and the message that I want to express, then I have to figure out a way to achieve it and to give a visual form to this idea. Uh, and this is exactly what I tried to do during this residency, because I had already done cyanotype before when I was a student, but I had never tried it uh, on ceramic before. I didn't even know if it was possible and how it was possible, so it was very experimental and I took a lot of risk, but uh, I'm very happy that uh, it worked. So the whole installation is called Blue Memories and yeah. <laughs> uh, so like how I got this idea. Uh, I consider that an artistic residency, this is really like a chance to um, experiment and try something new within a new space, a new country or a new culture. And I really believe that being somewhere else can bring new, new reflection on the surroundings. So um, to talk more a little bit about my works, uh, the main notions that I explore in my work are the observation of landscape and territories, but also the notions of memories and intimacy. I feel like I have a terrible French accent right now. I'm so sorry about no. that. <laughs> so during my studies, for example, I made an important research about relational art, uh, which, which was the main topic of my thesis. And today I continue to explore these notions by giving a voice, I would say, to the normal or seemingly ordinary people. So just to show you a couple of my previous works. So this is a very recent one. I did, I did this one during, uh, during the lockdown. It's called The Day I Almost Lost My Handkerchief. And basically this is uh, embroidery and handkerchief, but the real one that I got uh, when I was a little kid because I used to suck my thumb. <laughs> very hard, big time. <laughs> Some people are addicted to cigarettes. Me, I was addicted to my thumb. And basically, on this, uh, on this handkerchief, I'm telling the stories of the tragic, very tragic days where I almost lost one of my handkerchief. <laughs> uh, this is a mouchoir, you know, like a little, little piece, a little piece of fabric. Yes. Like a boat thing, there is uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little piece of fabric, you know, like when you're a kid, and I was always having it in my in my hand, you know, and always carrying it everywhere, like e absolutely doo -doo everywhere, like, like a doo doo, exactly. <laughs> so this is writing in French, but some of them. Some of you can speak a very good French, so you can you can read it also. Yeah. So basically, I'm just like embroidering the story of the day 
where we went, we went on a walk with my grandparents and I was carrying my handkerchief and I don't know what happened. I forgot it in the, in the car probably. And uh, somewhere in the midway, I just realized I did not have it anymore and I started to cry, but it was a very tragic event, you know, like you have no idea, you know, like. <laughs> and basically, I just realized, you know, when we came back into the car that it was still there. So I'm just like telling these stories by embroidering it on the handkerchiefs. And you can see all the threads uh, hanging out from, from the handkerchief. And basically, they all, they all mix all together. And they really like represent, you know, like these very old memories uh, that are leaking and are mixing all together. Uh, another work that I would like to introduce to you to talk about this, um, this uh, reflection of, about the memories that I have. Uh, it's an older project that I did. So it was uh, when I was living in Paris, I was working in a hospital and I met uh, Julien, who was a very, very old patient. He was like around 90, 95 years old. And the crazy thing is that he used to be one of the most famous hairdresser of Paris in his time. Like he was, uh, he was actually cutting the hair of all the very famous uh, stars uh, at that time. And I met him, and we start to have uh, to have a, to develop a friendship all together. So every Sunday, I will see him again, and we will have a cup of coffee together. And he just had lost his wife a couple of months before and me also like at that time of the year I was living in Paris I was uh, I wasn't in a like, good period of my life so we start to like to talk about each other and to share uh, so many things about our emotion and I decided like to do uh, to do a whole project with him I went to his place and I asked him to cut my hair it was like completely free. He could do absolutely anything he wanted. And while he was cutting my hair, I was uh, writing my thoughts, my emotions in a notebook like I am doing uh, on this picture. Uh, basically, it was automatic writing, you know, so you just, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, what it is, automatic writing. This is a uh, something that was uh, implied and created by the surrealist, uh, surrealistic movement. So basically, you have to write anything that comes to your mind without even thinking about it. And it feels very good to do this. So you just like write, write, write anything that comes to your mind and you just like don't stop. So while he was cutting my hair, I was writing. So the pictures have been taken by uh, actually uh, Luz, my very good friend, who is also a photographer. Ah. So this is like some of the previous uh, projects that I have done. The second part of this project, this is also an interview, a video interview uh, of him. Uh, so to come back uh, to the project that I did during my residency here, so I would maybe uh, imply one word, which is surrounding. This is a very, um, very important word to talk about this project. So I wanted to create a, a project inspired by the surrounding of my destination. And knowing nothing about Lisbon, the first thing that occurred to me was the blue color. So like this intense, deep, cobalt blue that you will find on the walls of the city and most specifically on the tiles. So it was my starting point, the blue color. Then I remember that cyanotype has more or less the same, uh, the same kind of shade of blue. And this is how I made the first connection. So as I said, I had already done cyanotype uh, in the past, but only on paper. So I thought it would be a good idea and a good project to experiment uh, it on something new. So like the ties has a way to 
rethink and to reinterpret uh, the traditional Portuguese styles, but more with a narrative and poetic uh, twist or interpretations. Uh, so the very first direction that I had was to print pictures that I would take during my time in Lisbon. So I really wanted to take pictures of the little things happening around me. Um, and I really wanted to be aware of my surroundings and capture the moment of life happening and to, to reflect on it. Uh, so the concept of this little moment uh, captured by the photographic medium, um, it really interests me particularly on a poetic and narrative level. And I would like to use uh, as an example the concept of Roland Barthes. Um, that he developed in the book uh, Camera Lucia. In French, this is La Chambre Claire. So basically, this book, this is an inquiry into the nature and the essence of photography, and um, it investigates the effect of photography on the spectators. So basically, in this book, what, what he says, Roland Barthes, this is that when you, we take a picture, a moment is like immortalized, and at the same time, gone forever. So when we look at a photograph, we are confronted with what he calls the having been there. Or in French, uh, he says le ça a été. And this is like a, a testament to the existence of a specific things that happen in a specific place at a very specific moment, but which is also like gone forever. So a photograph can only like show the past, but it represents it in such a way that it appears in the present. And this is like a, like a paradox, basically, that lends a photograph to kind of feeling of a nostalgia. So the way I interpret it through my project was to almost like like if I wanted to give eyes and language to these styles, like if basically they were alive or like if they were a camera capturing you know like all these little moments and showing it to us then uh, all the little things that we we hardly notice anymore because when we walk in the street we don't really pay attention to to these things we go to we walk to go from a point a to a point b and we don't really like pay attention to these things so that was a very good thing so, so to be there during this artistic residency to really like take the time to observe again all the little things happening and there are lots <laughs> there are a lot a lot of things very very funny and interesting things happening constantly all around <laughs> us <laughs> but we just don't see it anymore because we are just like somewhere else in another place but when we really pay attention it's wow wow <laughs> it's everywhere so for this part of the project like wandering in the city and getting lost in the streets and taking pictures was definitely the first step uh, I took every picture with my iPhone because it was uh, easier and it was quicker and this is like better because carrying you know like a big uh, big camera it might you know like also scare the people can you imagine you know you're walking the street and you're doing something crazy and another crazy person takes like a picture of you and like in the digital world we live, you know, like you might wonder, uh, yes, so <laughs> where is going to end up the picture that you just took of me, you know, like me carrying my nose like it in the street, you know. Like <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it was easier to take it with my, with my iPhone. And then I also wanted to, to write about this moment I just witnessed and to, to give my impressions about it in a very... Um, Rough, rough and intuitive way, uh, a little bit like the automatic writings, basically. Um, so when, like the thing that I wrote about all these moments, it was very easy. I just like didn't like think about it too much. I just like tried to, in a very short statement, to tell what just happened and the impressions that I got about this. So it was the first pass, yes, a couple of pictures that I could take. 
yeah, these things that cracks me up, you know, like uh, grandpa smoking a huge pipe like it. And then uh, once I arrived here, and while I was discovering the city, um, I was also very surprised and then very inspired by um, the, all the abandoned buildings and the ruins in Lisbon. Uh, yeah, at first I was like very surprised, but then it really, it very like started to, to interest me because how I interpret it. If the ties were capturing the moment in my instant memory, it also means that they would become memories more and more blur and fragmented as the time passed by. And they will, like, at some point for everybody, all these little moments, you remember, you remember them on the moment, but then if you don't really like have something to, to remember them or if you are not thinking about it every day, at some point you are gonna forget about it and it's gonna become blur. So a little bit like all these abandoned buildings in a way they are going to, to turn into ruins like it. So therefore for the second part of the installations, it could represent the, the ruins of my time in Lisbon in the future when I will be older or even sooner because I have a goldfish memory. And <laughs> <laughs> so to symbolize it, I have created a new design that I have also printed with uh, cyanotype, but on cracked and broken, uh, broken ties that are also more fragmented into the space. Um, this is a design that I have like uh, created this is more visible to see it, uh, to see it like it. Uh, this is a little bit weird, <laughs> but basically I start to take some pictures of all the abandoned buildings that I could see also. And then I have like created these compositions where you can see my shadow walking through <laughs> these buildings and some of, some of parts, some of their parts, you know, are also disappearing. So I had to draw over them. And then this is like more to talk about uh, the technical parts of the cyanotype, how it works. But then basically what you have to do this is to print it on um, transparent paper like it. You have to create a negative and then you have to print it on, on, uh, on um, acetate, so on a plastic, transparent uh, plastic sheet. And then how it works, you have to apply on the paper or on the tiles a layer of, uh, of uh, cyanotype and then you just uh, solarize it and ta-da, this is the result. <laughs> you leave the yes, you leave it under the sun. Uh, for a while here because it is very sunny, uh, six minutes it was enough. Uh, when I say that it was uh, uh, at first very hard to figure out uh, the recipe, so like for a while during the residency I've been quite stuck because I couldn't really like figure out uh, uh, the way to print it because like it wasn't working and in the middle I was completely panicking because I was like oh no it's not gonna work <laughs> nothing is gonna work and screw uh, and finally I ended up like figuring it out but it wasn't it wasn't super easy uh, yes so to come back to this composition so this is like completely fictional uh, and it symbolizes a way of memory, um, in a way the memory of being there, sorry. So like the compositions represent the ephemerity of everything and particularly of things that we have seen and did, but that at some point we don't really remember. And because a memory is something very fragile and precious, it is important to bring them to light. You see where I'm going? <laughs> Especially the very small and significant memories because, yeah, I think they are often the most, uh, the most magical ones. 
so we are already coming to the end. I really hope that you have liked the installations, <laughs> Blue Memories. Uh, and I don't know if you knew, but please don't forget to take a little piece uh, of my memories also for those who haven't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you will take a little piece of memory uh, of my memory with you. And finally, I really would like to thank Gemma and Jose for this opportunity <laughs> to be there. <laughs> the team Colino, where I have done I have done all the ties. Uh, Rebecca for being the best uh, flatmate during this month <laughs> and Rui and Salome for their great kindness and advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very much <much-wise>, Yes. <laughs> so my first question is I wouldn't define you as a mixed media artist, mm -hmm. I would define you as a post-studio artist. A post-studio? Post-studio artist. What do you mean? Hmm? It's somebody that is more interested about relationship and ah. using medium mm -hmm. as a way of creating their own artwork. Like, for me it was very special. All the things about having a crisis, because you have a structured idea, but you didn't know if it would work. Then you find a place that to ceramic, then you work here in the sun to create the tiles. And for me, you pass less time in the studio, more in the street. Yes, 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 true. And so for me, it's a very interesting definition of an artist because we return to the relational part. And like something, I think you less price is you, you're saying you're going out and just taking some random picture but actually the moment you find a really kind of a quantum in the sense that mm. you need to have to be yourself a person that is there to observe and to give the time to capture that and in the end for me your first installation is very beautiful because it's a kind of a crack mirroring of the city and I think it's a very like it's almost if you wanted to discover Lisbon and then jump out of it and even the last installation your presence is there but in the shadow is not so invasive. How about adopting this new this new <laughs> definition on your artistic mm, practice? No, I think I think you're right. Uh, yes, yes. It it makes sense because uh, as I said, when I did my master's degree in fine arts, I, I, I did my thesis about relation, relational arts. This is something that has always, always interested me. And I think I'm, yeah, really a people person. I, I, I really like to communicate uh, <laughs> and to be with people uh, yeah, yeah, and to meet new people. And I think that for some works, like for example, the work that I did with, with Julien, I, with this uh, person, um, eighty percent of the work had to be done before actually uh, this uh, this uh, performance where he's cutting cutting my hair. This is all the times that we have passed together before that was uh, necessary actually to um, yeah to be able to to like to go to the point where he will accept to to have me as a guest at his, at his place and to cut my hair so this is like all the relationship that we had we had to create together that was yeah uh, definitely i think uh, a part of uh, of uh, of the final uh, artwork and probably also like the biggest part of it, yeah. But it's like your project here, we had chemicals arriving from another country, you had already set up with a ceramic studio. Like for me it was interesting how your presence here became the social interaction. Yeah. I cannot, and it reminds me of a French artist, but I cannot recall her name, that makes such a beautiful work about following people. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, no. Ah, oh, God. Sophie. Sophie. Uh, Sophie Cal. Sophie Cal. Yes, Sophie Cal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like her. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
Yes, yes, true. I, I had already done something also like this. I was uh, following uh, old, uh, old people in the street. Uh, so like, I, I'm, no, no, I know. <laughs> I'm a little bit obsessed with old people. Don't, no, you can ask me why. It's also, I think, because uh, I, I grew up with my grandparents. And uh, I'm completely obsessed with old people. Every time I see an old grandpa, old grandma, I'm just like, <gasps> I want to know everything about you. Tell me your story. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that, so it's really, for the photos to be picked, you had to just see it in real time. And did you ever, did you ever think that you could look back? Or like, did you, you never tried to look for a certain photo to take. It was only no. by Yeah, yeah. And you just had the feeling like this. Yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely. Mm -hmm. Completely. Like uh, when when I had to go uh, to Saint Maclou in the deep, deep, deep uh, <laughs> end of Lisbon, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, took, I took a picture there, but. Uh, Finally, even though it was like very hard to go there because I wanted like to go to get some some ties to do some tests on it, but it was so far and I had to take two buses to go there. I got lost on the almost on the motorway. I didn't know where I was. It was like super hard like to to go there. But because I I took like I took like the picture of this woman. I was like so happy actually like I finally had done it so because if I did not have like went there, you know, like I never would have had the, the, the picture of this woman, so. I think what's nice about the photographs is that you can really tell they were in action. So I think it makes it, they all have, like you can really sense your perspective as, as the artist, as you were, um, it just feels very authentic in that you found, you know, just the right time to find, to capture something that wasn't making your presence known, and I think that's, um, I think that's really nice as a photographer to be able to really communicate that, like this is just a still, and you really get that feeling, like these are, you know, just little snippets and then they carry on. So, like Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Really Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will try. Uh, you really got a grip on Lisbon. Uh, yeah, I yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I got okay. here and, uh, for instance, I immediately recognized the poster of the wanted cat, the cat. Ah, yes, the yes. It's in my area. And I must say that today I met the guy with the cat on the Oh, really? <laughs> really? Yeah, he was in the, 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 sa the same guy, the same guy the same and you recognize him. Did you tell him that he was part of my work? Or? Yeah, I didn't uh, say like hello, how are you? But yeah. uh, I was with um, my kid, and I was uh, saying like, hey, look, this guy has a cat on the on the beach. Oh, uh, so this is something he's doing often, I guess. Yeah, uh, the then. cat is still learning. Not, he was not very happy to be on, the on a leash. Okay. When I saw the guy, there was no leash. He was just like on on his yeah, shoulder. It was the same guy. Okay. Uh, it was on, the, on his back, but I recognized it. It's still with his uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian, Hawaiian T-shirt. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and I really, I really have congratulations on the work, and I really like the. The, the idea of the fragmented memory, I think it's very interesting. And, um, and with the, well, with this using chemistry and all these things that could go wrong, it works out nicely. And uh, it was really nice to see you work also. Thank so you. <laughs> Thank you, we. I have a short question. I am wondering. Uh, it seems like a verbal narrative is quite important to you, and I read like a lot of your memories on the paper back there. And each piece is uh, quite complete, almost like a complete novel or a play concept. Um, so uh, I was wondering about two things. Well, what's your connection with the, or how do you feel your connection with the verbal narrative? And uh, 
second thing is like from that, it, it seems to me that even those that though they seem to be presented as accidental snapshots, they seem to be quite complete uh, pieces. And if you want to comment on that. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I really uh, got the question uh, out, out of that. Well, the question is, what's your connection? How do how do you find how do you feel about your connection with the uh, verbal narrative? So you, you, you first you showed us uh, handkerchiefs with a verbal narrative, which is uh, I haven't read them, but I read a little bit. But I definitely read those uh, those memories on on, on the paper. Yes. As I said, each one is, is, a, is a complete, is a complete, pretty complete concept. It's not like, you know, it's not that abstract. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty complete. So, mm. observation that I made, and uh, I'm wondering about your connection with the, with the verbal or literary, if you like. Yes. You okay. Literary rather than verbal. Literary narrative. Okay. Uh, if you're expressing that, maybe maybe there's something in the background that uh, makes you connect to the yeah. narrative yes. in that way. I and guess. Maybe because okay. of that, mm -hmm. maybe you you know do do also maybe think that your pieces end up being quite uh, complete. Mm -hmm. Now that you you pointed out, actually, uh, it, it makes me realize that. Uh, Writing is a very important part of my works. I mean, if you if you like notice it, you know, like the two previous work that I have presented to you, uh, there is writing included actually. So I would I would say, and I guess that this is something uh, quite important in my work. At some point, I would feel the need to to write, to write down some words, some uh, short uh, statements or sentences. Uh, it, it's really funny because I never really like realized how important it is in my works. But it's there. Yeah, 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 it, it's there. But uh, yeah, yeah, now that you're pointing out, I just realized that uh, definitely like uh, writing, writing is something uh, quite, uh, quite important in my works. Um, However, I, 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 I would. Um, um, yeah, uh, I um, I don't really know like how to to answer this question, but um, yeah, I guess that it has always always been there. Uh, I have always uh, write a lot when I was younger. I always had a a diary. Diary or diary? Like, yeah, di diary. I always confuse diary or diary, you know, like a yeah, diary, <laughs> which is not the same. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I think I, I write a lot. I write a lot, and that's why maybe it's uh, maybe it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, my question I have a question and a commentary. Um, in which way your tiles were influenced by Portuguese tiles? Mm. I don't know if you saw them in the city. Like yes, I went. I went to visit. <laughs> on the street. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I have to say that Lisbon is quite fantastic for that because there are like your murals and tiles absolutely everywhere. This is like pretty amazing. Even in the subway stations, uh, it's absolutely everywhere. So Lisbon is a museum itself. Actually, you just have to to go in the street like to to see them and to find them. Well, I had only been like to Portugal once before it was uh, it was in 2016 I think yeah uh, I think it was in 2016 and it was in Porto and also there like uh, I don't know like I've been very like impressed by by the ties I immediately thought it was like so beautiful so when because then reconstructed it. yes and then when, when I apply to this uh, to this uh, art residency I don't know I, I wanted to do something with uh, with the ties but uh, not particularly because I was uh, inspired by the ties of Lisbon, but I don't know, I really wanted to do something uh, with the ties. It was just like first idea. Yeah. 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 Y
okay. immediately ties <laughs> blue ties <laughs> and, and then another thing you were you were talking about that uh, those things that you you do and then they go away it's an instant like those photographs and mm -hmm. stuff like that um you mean the, you mean the memories yeah yes yes mm -hmm. it reminds me of that Buddhist approach to the art in which they, they have the, the, those sand works, beautiful sand works, they take days doing them. Mm -hmm. And then when they are uh, complete, yeah. uh, they just uh, make the wind uh, throw them away. Ah. And uh, I think it's very beautiful your approach with that because uh, I. And, and photographs are like haikus, I like this Asian uh, Japanese approach to. Life and okay, I thought nature. you were referring to this summer park where they do sand sculpture. Like, I, I, you are speaking about mandalas or. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, so sorry. I'm going way back. I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, not this way. I'm scared. <laughs> okay, it's just a commentary. I don't know if you mm. want to comment on it. Actually, this is funny that you say that because we, 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 uh, we had this also like. Um, we made this discovery when we found out that actually, you know, they still, even though I had, I, I burnished all the ties, so they are supposed to be sealed and not move at all. But again, this is because this is very experimental, you know, like anything could still happen right now. And uh, we, we had these little pieces and we kept it like on the sun and we find out that even, even after being sealed by the vanish, it was still reacting to the sun and getting darker. So I assume that if, for example, I was keeping uh, one of the, like, uh, the, the ties on a very bright and sunny place, at some point, it will disappear, I think, because it will keep react uh, to the sun, and uh, I think it will react, and it, it will disappear, and getting like, uh, more, blue and, uh, blue and, more blue and blue, uh, blue or blue, uh, blue, bluer and bluer. Until it turns completely like a super dark and black, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. And this comes, I think, uh, the, the question about your um, artistic practice or what do you think will happen from here if you if you bring in some of this technique abroad or or what is your next crazy relational plan <laughs> for studio practice? Ah. Yes, so next, uh, next plan after that, I think I'm, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to keep uh, doing uh, cyanotype, no, probably not, when, I, when I'm going to come back, I think I'm going to be done uh, with this uh, project and uh, not thinking about cyanotype or ties or blue uh, after I got some other projects uh, that I've been um, Working on, and I'm not done. So I, when I, once I'm, go, I'm going back, I think I want to complete this other project. And you're you not giving us even a sniff of what is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I could give you a little sniff. So uh, this is another very important project that I'm going to to. I would like to finish very quickly. Uh, recently, I've been making knitting actually a whole dress completely red and uh, which is almost done and uh, once it's, once it's going to be done I would like to perform um, a performance which is going to be uh, recorded by the video where I'm basically going to walk in a whole straight line knitting, knotting, you know, like the last uh, the thread No. Louisa Bacardi commercial when she got Ah, okay, okay. So marketing uh, and art. Martini. Martini, Martini, Martini. 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 With a black dress. Ah, she okay. So I'm going to do that, but with a, with a red dress this time. And this is um, related to the story of my grandmother, actually, who was a like an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, artist. Uh, she was uh, knitting, uh, embroidering uh, like a goddess. She was very, very good at that. And on parallel of that, I'm also gonna create um, a podcast where I'm gonna 
interview people and also I've wrote uh, like a big text about um, how and why knitting used to be only something uh, dedicated like to women to women and now it's still more or less the same even though there are like a younger generation of people of young women who are like really into knitting and but why is this still something uh, terribly uh, terribly only uh, dedicated to women you know like even Actually, in the marketing point of view they only target you know the like uh, like it's young true, women but during the pandemic mm. there was some revelation from my part like uh, my mother put all of my male parts of the family knitting oh really okay for their brain connection <laughs> <laughs> Yes, true, true. Yes, true. I've seen that. Yes, yes, I've seen that. But I think there are still some exceptions. Yes, I think, yes. Like, it's very good for them. Like, uh, it's so nice to see that, but I still think that there are, there are like, some, some exceptions. Uh, but no, no, no. I, like, I remember when I was, uh, when I was a little girl, so my grandmother, she really wanted me to, to learn how to knit. And I hated this so much, like I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And she was forcing me like, oh, let's do it together every Sunday. And I was like, no, I want to go play football outside, leave me alone. <laughs> but during the lockdown, I, I pick it up again. And this is how I start like, to, to, have, uh, to have all this um, reflection and this thought, because like knitting is something very meditative, uh, actually. So when I was like, Knitting, I like. I just like start to remember, you know, like my, my grandmother when she was knitting, and try to to put myself in her shoes, and yeah, try to to understand her better. Also, yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes, 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 yes. So I really want to, to talk about this because uh, I think that unfortunately my grandmother, she, uh, she was a very strong woman, but she was also a victim of uh, the time she was living in as a woman. And uh, yes, yeah, this is a little bit a way to, uh, to give her a voice again. <laughs> and also, uh, this is a joke, like, you are like Picasso, you are passing from the blue period yeah. to the red period, then red period, so many colors. <laughs> sorry, sorry, this is like too much. It's true, it's true. It's also because like, I picked the red color because it represents also um, the link between her and me, uh, generational link. Because yeah, like yeah, I'm using the thread, question, yes. I'm not mm. You are choosing it in, like things happen and then. You just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's true. <laughs> I had my blue period. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say yeah. something that I thought was really interesting about your work. It kind of two separate thoughts. So the first is like, I think we travel because we want like a glimpse of like authenticity but I think a lot of times when we travel to we like that can be hard to find because as like corporations you know like there's McDonald's in the US and in France and mm -hmm. in Portugal and like we and in some ways we see like culture becoming the same but then also not mm. and I feel like you were able to kind of dig all of that up through your pictures but I also really love the contrast of like using the iPhone to take pictures but then referencing tile and ceramic which has been around mm. for centuries and then also this nanotype like lends it this really beautiful kind of like old feeling and like creates that nostalgia that you're referencing with Bart and I just love I don't know I love like the coming together of all of that and like it's so modern but then also touches something like so old and essential too. Thank you. <laughs> I like old things. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like old people, and I like old things. I can't wait to be old myself, by the way. <laughs> it's interesting to think about like it's so it's so fast to take a picture, but your process was so slow. Mm. Yeah. You made the tiles. Yeah, yeah. I also made the tiles. Yeah. <laughs>
Did you cook them? Yes, I cooked them. Well, not me, but um, the, the people at the studio, they, well, we did that together because I, yeah, it was the first time I was doing that, so I don't really know how to use the kiln. <laughs> and it's like innovation, but with these older forms, like cyanotype, I'm assuming, has probably been around for a few decades, but like... Yeah, I don't know how old it is, like cyanotype. I think it's not that old. Okay. Yeah. And you're still doing like this whole mm. mashup of trying it on tile and mm. like these are old but then they're new together. Yeah. Thank That's you so much, cool. Rachel. It's very traditional but yeah, brought yeah. into mm -hmm. contemporary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very good point. Uh, when I was saying that. That's why we love the mentoring traditional <laughs> contemporary. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you do not have any other questions. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to hide in a corner now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>